Hello and welcome back to A Better World. This is your host Mitchell J. Rabin and we're very glad you're joining us again today. Today we're going to have another very interesting show. We are very pleased to have with us in our studio Rupert Sheldrake, the well-known biologist and scientist renowned for his work with morphogenetic fields in The New Science of Life, a book he wrote a number of years ago, and he's been the author of a number of books since. In fact, he has moved into a most interesting domain for a scientist and a kind of domain we need more attention to, which is that of parapsychology, of looking at morphogenetic fields and morphic resonance, this idea that he, he was very involved in promoting and bringing forth a way of understanding fields as a place of communication. He'll be speaking about that with us. And this has led to, among other books, this work of his, the latest, The Sense of Being Stared At. We all know what that's like, but how many of us have actually thought about it from a scientific point of view and looked at the phenomenon itself? Well, that's the kind of thing that we'll be exploring here today. So welcome, Sh Rupert. Great to have you. Good to be here. Good. Uh, what counts would you say for your kind of shift in focus of the kind of work that you had been doing as a scientist, as a biologist, w focusing on morphogenetic fields to the kind of domain that you're working in now? Well, it's partly a question of looking at the nature of the fields in space. My previous work, I was emphasizing the relation in time, morphic resonance and memory in nature. When I focused on evidence for the fields themselves, connecting things together in space, I realized that one of the implications was with social groups, that they're connected together, birds in flocks, schools of fish, um, pets and their uh, owners, um, mm -hmm. human social groups, are connected together spatially through these fields. And then I realized this theory gave rise to the prediction of things like telepathy. Um, so this seemed like a good area to try and test the theory because there's already a lot of evidence these things happen. There's already some research on these topics. Right. And uh, I also found that this so it's was... it's kind of a natural, no pun intended, um, extension of what you had already come to understand. Yes, it was an extension of what I was doing before. But why I got into it particularly was that I was trying to think of how I can get experiments done that would help shift things forwards. Um, in a way that was inexpensive. The trouble with doing radical research is that it's very difficult to get grants. Yes. So one way of dealing there's with that... There's always a pragmatic side to science. <laughs> well, yes, but there's also an ideological side, and there is a taboo against this kind of thing, you see. So, um, Which is still a belief system, interestingly enough. Oh, certainly it of is. Course. Yes, it's, it's a very strong belief rigorously system. rigorously scientific at all, right? No. It's actually uh, so religious. <laughs> it's, a kind of re it's a kind of scientific fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. that, um, yeah. So in 1994, I wrote a book called Seven Experiments That Could Change the World. And that was an attempt to find seven low-cost experiments that could really help move us forward, changing the paradigm of reality as seen by science. Mm -hmm. One of those experiments was on the sense of being stared at. Uh, another one was on dogs that know when their owners are coming home. And of those seven experiments, those are the two that met with the greatest public response, the greatest interest. I started getting letters from pet owners all over the world telling me about their dogs and cats and what they could do. And I realized this was a potentially rich field of research. Yeah. Um, and it enabled me to come at parapsychological phenomena from a biological point of view. If these things exist, I think they exist in animals, they're part of nature. I don't think that yeah. things like telepathy are just human phenomena on the margins of human psychology. If they exist, they've evolved, they have a reason to be there, and they're part of a survival system mm -hmm. for many species of animals. Indeed. So I looked Including at, human. Including humans. So I spent some... Just like you could say language is also not uniquely human, which is thought to be the case for so long. I'm well, assuming. animals certainly have communication systems. They don't obviously speak to each other in English, but they have... No, uh, no, no, uh, certainly. But they have rather sophisticated yes. speaking systems, we've found out. So anyway, I found that um, by looking at telepathy in dogs and cats and other animals, it was possible to 
find that a lot of evidence that this was real, that it was biological, that it's really going on. Mm -hmm. That I summarized in my previous book, Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home, and Other Unexplained Powers of Animals. And that then led me on to looking at these things in the human realm, but approaching them from a biological rather than a strictly parapsychological point of view. Um, and the feeling of being stared at, uh, one of the other seven experiments in my Seven Experiments book, uh, was something that also aroused a lot of interest. I developed simple tests for this. They have many theoretical implications. They've been done in schools. People can do these experiments on the internet now. Um, these are, are very simple tests uh, which have enormous implications. So I've been working in these areas because it's fairly cheap, simple, inexpensive, uh, anyone can take part. It's a way of moving science in a new direction, not only through the content of what's done, but also by enabling large numbers of people to take part in it. So it's a much more participatory yes, kind of science. exactly. It's interesting because what you might be doing, um, after all, is accessing the larger fields which will ultimately influence what science gets funded. It's well, yes. sort of almost like a grassroots methodology, which is actually brilliant and, again, another extension, a logical extension of understanding the field phenomenon altogether. Yes. Well, it is a kind of grassroots methodology, and at the moment quite a number of my experiments are going on in high schools and in colleges. Mm -hmm. um, I encourage students to take them up as student projects. Um, several projects on the sense of being stared at have, be have won prizes in science fairs. So there has, in fact, been a lot of public it's participation. It's beginning to permeate, yes, exactly. Yes. Now, what is it, would you say, excited you most from the discoveries that you made of seeing the statistics of the probability changing? Maybe you could just outline some of the statistics that you've come across in, for instance, a film that you have that was shot in Austria of the coordination of an intention of an owner to come home and the dog at home, sitting quietly and comfortably, even sleeping, ra getting roused right at that moment of the intention being set to return. Could you mm. speak about the probability of that and the um, significance mm. of the statistics on that? Well, the phenomenon of dogs and cats and other animals that know when their owners are coming home is widely observed. We've shown that about... Absolutely. Surveys have shown that about... I've done surveys in Britain and America. About 50% of dog-owning households have found that the dog knows when a member of the household's coming home. About 30% of cat owners have noticed this. So it's common. It's not something weird. I mean, there must be millions of dogs oh. and cats in America doing this. Um, so what's really it's going on? It's essentially a consensually agreed-upon fact. Oh, yes. A lot of pet owners completely take it for granted. Oh, yeah. But then the question is, how does it work? Right. And many people assume, well, it must be routine. And, but many people don't have routine lives, so that actually isn't the explanation. Then most people think, oh, well, then it must just be the dog hearing the car from a long distance away. But that doesn't explain the fact that many people who live in Manhattan, for example, who travel on the subway, uh, have exactly. pets that anticipate their return 10 minutes, 15 minutes in advance. And how can a pet know when they're on a subway you know, 30 blocks away. Right. Um, Those variables are overcomable. Yes. Yeah. So I, I set up specific tests to find out what was going on. In our tests, we film the place the dog waits all yes. the time the person's out. We have a complete record of when the dog goes to the door or window. Exactly when it goes, it's on the time code on the videotape. We have people go at least five miles away. They come home at randomly chosen times. We signal with a pager when to come home. Uh, and to avoid familiar car sounds, they travel by taxi. And these experiments have been done, uh, we've done more than 100 with one particular dog. Uh, we've done it with several different dogs, but the most investigated dog is a dog called JT in England. Mm -hmm. And um, these experiments show that over and over and over again, the dog goes and starts waiting when the owner forms the intention to come home, before she's even got into the taxi or the car. So this shows that the dog seems to be responding to her intention, her thoughts, at a distance. And the word for that is telepathy, really. Telepathy means distant feeling, the ability to respond to thoughts or emotions at right. a distance. Or reading. So what is your scientific explanation of the phenomenon? 
Well, um, I think that when animals are bonded with others, as they are in flocks of birds or wolf packs or human families or pets and their owners, if there's a strong bond between them, mm -hmm. um, I think that these bonds are mediated through what I call morphic fields. There's a field between the people or the people and the animal. When they, these fields link them together and when the people and the animal move apart, the field stretches. So it still continues to connect them like an invisible thread at a distance. And a change in one can affect the other. The closest physical parallel to this is quantum non-locality, where two particles that have been part of the same atom or molecule, uh, if they move apart, remain invisibly connected at a distance. So a change in one can affect the other. Right. And so this is a similar, analogous to telepathy between people or between people and animals. You know, you, you're referring to a stretchable, like a rubber band yes. dimension, if you will. Mm. And at the same time, it seems that what is, the phenomenon taking place is a field that even stretches beyond time and space. It doesn't seem to be limited by time and space. Would you say that that's been part of your observation? Well, the morphic field doesn't seem to fall off with distance. In that sense, it's not right. limited by space. I mean, dogs can know when their so own is coming. you say it's endlessly elastic. Well, we've done ex telepathy experiments between Britain and Australia, which is the Antipodes, and mm -hmm. they work very well over a distance as far as you can go on the Earth. I wouldn't like to say endlessly, because obviously we haven't had people returning home from the moon or anything, or, or the distant planets. Well, Edgar Mitchell actually was doing experiments back then. Well, yes, but that was still only from a satellite, you know, yeah. still endlessly would imply going through the whole galaxy. That was a very unscientific word. Excuse yes, so me. I, li I just, <laughs> right, I just I like, so as far as we know, <laughs> they seem, uh, yeah. uh, some of my telepathy tests we haven't talked about yet are the telephone telepathy tests. Uh -huh which I discuss which in this book here. Yeah. In the book, exactly. Um, Telephone telepathy. Th those work, people can get a feeling as to about somebody who's about to phone them. From thousands of miles away, from Australia to England, 12,500 miles. Yes. Um, so these do seem to be effects that go over large distances. I wouldn't say they're not limited by time, because otherwise you might get feelings that somebody's going to phone you and actually they're only going to phone you in 10 years' time or 10 years ago. It seems to be something that happens more or less in the present, this phenomenon. Um, the memory principle, morphic resonance, is a connection through time, but morphic fields link things through space more or less simultaneously, yes, yes, yes. which is how they account for telepathy, which is usually a real-time phenomenon. Right, exactly. It's so interesting. Now, is, the morphic fields are biological in nature, are they not? I mean, there's yeah. a... a biological substratum, if you will, to it? How would you describe Do you use well, words such as chi or life force or information field to describe well, those? Well, no, I don't usually because I find that those, um, I mean, it depends on what people, where they're coming from. I mean, right. <clears throat> I call sure. them morphic fields because um, I started off in developmental biology and there the term morphogenetic field is a widely accepted term. It's a, yes. a term for biological fields that organize the bodies of living organisms. Um, I think similar fields link groups of organisms, and I call them morphic fields. They're not to do with morphogenesis, they're to do with social groups, another kind of uh, morphic field. Mm -hmm. um, whether you call uh, they are kind of information fields. They're fields of information, and so you could call them that, information fields. Yes. I don't call them chi fields because I don't know enough about chi and what chi is. Right. I mean, if right. I'd studied oriental uh, physiology and medical systems, maybe I would. But I wouldn't like to equate them necessarily with what people call chi because um, I don't know, for example, whether the chi theory extends to animals and to the bonds between people and animals. Maybe it does, maybe mm. it doesn't. It actually does. Okay, yeah. well, maybe they're but you equivalent. you don't have to use that phrase. No, that's if, if <laughs> others who are experts in oriental systems can see the parallels, that's fine. Sure. But I'm coming to this out of the Western scientific tradition using Western terminology. Definitely. And if it... Uh, coincides with other systems like the chi system, yes. that's an added bonus. Exactly. Sort of where I come and look in at your work 
Rupert is I see uh, it's almost as though there is where it brings to mind this notion of there being one field actually there's actually one field of which we are a subset and in fact perhaps the entire material world is a subset almost like one enormous nervous system mm -hmm. so it would then be no surprise that a dog would be responding to um, the owner's intention because they're actually part of the same system they're not well, separate and I think perhaps science runs amok when it makes an assumption there is an inherent subject, uh, assumption which is part of the fundamentalism that we are not part of one field then well, you have to keep starting to prove or seeking to prove mm. why is this happening where in a sense it's almost and some uh, it can be presumed to be happening. Well, Do you know what I mean? Yes, well, there's several things I could say to that. First of all, regular science does accept that everything's part of one field, the universal gravitational field, which is one of the kinds of fields that all scientists agree about. And that well, field... Well, that's, that's terrestrial. That doesn't exist. Well, no, it connects. The, the whole universe is within the universal gravitational field. It, you know, every star... In, this is one of the most integrated views, and in even Newton, you see, he said every particle of matter attracts every other particle of matter in the universe. So everything is interconnected. And we often forget that mechanistic science also has a side to it which emphasizes interconnection. Yes. Einstein's universal theory of gravitation says that the, the Earth has a gravitational field, so does the Sun, so does the galaxy. But all galaxies are attracting each other too, and the entire universe is enclosed within a universal field. So it does admit one field. But I think that may be going too far too fast to explain a phenomena like a dog knowing when its owner's coming home. I think what matters there is the field between them. If it were an undifferentiated field that included all dogs and all owners, then dogs all over the place would be reacting every time anyone goes home. Right. Uh, the interesting <laughs> right. thing is that yes. they're only reacting when their owner goes home. Exactly. So it's a much There's more specific field. Yeah. You could say, so ultimately, these interconnections are derived from some deeper connective principle. And indeed, a lot of modern physics is based on trying to find a unified field behind all the other fields of nature. It's one of the features of superstring theory. Um, but these unified fields are more theoretical and more abstract than the fields that actually do the business that we're interested in. You're implying that without using the word, because it's a very unscientific word, and that's probably very good, the love that exists between the owner and his or her pet, hmm. and because we see in the human realm the same phenomenon, hmm. between people who know each other really well, and we could safely say in many cases that there's a bond certainly an emotional bond, and often of love. Yes. Mother and child. Yes. Mother and daughter. Mm. Husband and wife, mm. etc. Mm. So is there, have you done any kind of experience, this is a, a different part of the picture, but dealing with the, with the subsets, that there's a proportionate relationship between the amount of love and the amount of that interconnectedness mm. you mentioned, to the ability to, for the dog or the human to pick up the intention of the other. Well, I haven't done enough studies. So there's studies. some proportionate relationship. I haven't done enough studies to um, find out if there's a direct proportion. I doubt yeah. that it was as simple as that, though, because when it comes to telepathic sensitivity, um, there are individual differences, just as there are in differences in musical ability, sense of smell, Tasting. hearing, <laughs> taste. Right. I mean, those animals aren't all the same. And, um, for example, one group of people I've studied in depth are blind people with guide dogs. They often build up very close bonds with the dogs. They depend on them in a way yes. that most people don't depend on their dogs. They, right. There's an extremely close bond. And some people who are blind who have guide dogs say, well, my present dog picks up my thoughts all the time. I only have to think where I want it to go, and the dog will just take me there. 
Uh, but then they sometimes say, well, my previous dog was a very good guide dog, but it just didn't seem to pick up my thoughts yes. in the same kind of way. Surely. And so there's individual differences there, and there are between people as well. And the bond of love may be the same, um, but some people just may be more sensitive to this, um, exactly. this telepathic That's input. And That's some a very, very good too. point, actually. It's a very good point, because actually, just recently, I learned that, um, distinct from other dogs, the pit bull has... Uh, uh, predominance, uh, predominant function of the reptilian brain and less of the mammalian. Sure, it's a mammal, but it has many reptilian features and it doesn't bond as easily to humans mm. as many other dogs do. Mm. So I, I'm just seeing that there could be a neurophysiological reason mm. that would also um, limit a possible ability of a dog's uh, a dog to have a certain amount of perception of this type? Possibly. Um, I mean, I've, actually, I've never done any studies with pit bulls, so I can't really comment on them as a it's breed. It's probably good that you haven't. <laughs> well, it, it may be sig significant. I've not had any cases in my database of these yeah. things with pit bulls. But still, I mean, pit bulls aren't that common, and, right. and so I wouldn't like to say. but. What we found but with the, the, the here we have a basically a morphological, you know, no pun intended, um, point that could also be impinging on oh, it the, could, uh, yes, obviously on the bonding the, the structure. Function. Yes, it could do. Yeah, yeah. But um, in terms of knowing when owners are coming home, all sorts of breeds of dogs do it. It doesn't seem, you know, it's not as if terriers do it more than exactly. Labradors, for example. We found right, right. examples in most breeds of Across dogs. Cross species, yes. exactly. Very interesting, very interesting. What are the implications of this for humanity? I mean, certainly there's an, a pretty obvious, I'd say, um, survival function to be able to be telepathic. So if, let's say, someone is near harm's way, mm. um, but everything looks fine, but, you know, danger is around the corner and they're able to sense it, you know, what other implications have you kind of come across in your own kind of contemplating this whole thing for us as humans and the unfolding of a new society that we're in a sense mm. giving birth to, where this kind of science, by the way, is getting more and more popular? Mm. Well, in this book, I discuss several different kinds of unexplained human ability. One is telepathy, the, which we've discussed, sure. the ability to pick up when someone you're close to needs you or is about to call you on the phone, a mother knowing when her baby's had an accident or is in distress. Right. These have obvious survival value because they enable organisms to keep in touch at a distance. And before the invention of telephones, this was the only way really people had of keeping Very in true. touch. Um, then the sense of being stared at, I think is something that's evolved because it's useful. If, if a prey animal can feel when a predator's looking at it, it might yes. escape better than if it can't feel that. Exactly. If a person walking down a street in a, danger, in a dangerous part of town after dark suddenly feels someone staring at them in a way that could be aggressive or potentially dangerous, they might be able to escape better than if they just don't notice anything. Right. So these things are there because they have survival value. And premonitions of danger, people who get an intuition that something bad's about to happen and they get out of the way, or animals that have premonitions of earthquakes and get out of the way, or animals that feel when tsunamis are about to occur and get away from the beach, as mm -hmm. many, many animals did in, 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 this the, in the recent tsunami. Uh, these are, again, of obvious survival value. Um, so... I think the reason we have these abilities, which are all to do with interconnections with other species or with the environment or with other members of our own species, mm -hmm. um, all these kinds of interconnection mediated through fields um, are ones that uh, are useful of survival value. In, in the human realm, we've tended to play these things down. Animals have them better developed than most modern human beings. In traditional societies, they're better developed than they are in modern Western societies. Um, I think these are things we've largely lost. I think we can recover them again if we pay attention to them. And it, it's possible to train people's sensitivity in the oriental martial arts. People's sensitivity to being stared at is trained. Yes, indeed. So um, we could have them uh, better developed than we do. 
most people, I think, don't bother because modern technologies take care of a lot of these needs for us. Right. So like we lose telephones. So we exactly, lose we lose the skill. And in fact, uh, an old uh, friend of yours and colleague, Terence McKenna, um, posited uh, a time some hundred thousand years ago or so in human civilization, civilization too, where men and women were at parity in many ways, and uh, that our senses actually were extremely sharp. So, uh, and that was based on a, a number of different kinds of practices and rituals that we don't need to go into here, but he had certain really interesting imaginative ideas about the level of human beings at that time. So, hmm. in a sense, you're also suggesting, Rupert, that there has been a degeneration of that sense and sensibility. Mm. And now, in a sense, we're on the upswing yet again to incorporate this. Yes, I think it's... Even in the midst of uh, modern technology that is replacing or supplementing many well, of these yes. skills. Yes, I mean, it's interesting, actually, in connection with telepathy, that although I think we've lost a lot of these abilities, precisely because things like phones and emails give us the opportunity to connect with people anywhere in the world, um, it's, the telepathy hasn't gone away. Uh, what it's done is now taken on a new lease of life in connection yeah. with telephones and emails. The commonest kind of yeah. telepathy in the modern world is telephone telepathy, where people think of someone who then shortly afterwards calls. I've done lots of experiments on that and shown it's yeah. not just coincidence and selective memory. It really is a kind of telepathic communication. So the statistics say what? We, we're unfortunately running so out of time, but I do want to get the statistical statement if you could make okay well it's so far significant very briefly we've done tests where pe subjects if you're a subject you'd have four callers we pick the, you name them they're people you know well we pick the caller at random so you don't know who's going to call the phone rings you have to guess who it is before you pick up the phone by chance you'd be right one time in four in our filmed experiments 25 percent yeah 25 percent um in our filmed experiments people are right uh, 45 percent of the time compared with 25 percent not right every time but way above chance and in hundreds of trials which we've done this becomes massively significant massively so the evidence nearly is, twice it's nearly twice and some people score more than twice yes. that's an average um, so we're getting very highly significant results in these tests I now have an online telepathy test on my website www.sheldrake.org and I'd be very happy if you and anyone who's watching us sure. uh, would try it for themselves. Wonderful. Well, we'll make that available to the audience. And Good. Uh, thank you so much for the work that you're doing. You're helping to promote and bring forth um, a kind of inquiry. It's been, as far as I'm concerned, long overdue for science to put its attention to. Mm -hmm. And you're uh, helping to lead the way for that. So truly, I thank you. Good. Thank you. This is Mitchell J. Rabin for A Better World. We are seated here with Rupert Sheldrake, the author of this book, renowned scientist who is now developing the work and the direction on the scientific basis of parapsychological phenomena. Thanks so much for joining us and look forward to seeing you all next week.